Wrestling with God How Religion, Science, and Philosophy Bring the Ancient Search for Truth to Our Modern Minds Written and Recorded by Jonah Kunish To my saint of a mom who always believed in me And to everyone struggling to make sense of the world Don't stop wrestling And Jacob was left alone And a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, Let me go, for the day has broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And he said to him, What is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then he said, Your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for ye have striven with God and with men, and have prevailed. Genesis thirty two, twenty four through twenty eight. Introduction Jordan and Sam Gary Taubes Imagine a journalist came along and did more research than you could ever imagine and wrote a 500-page tome explaining that God exists. Sam Harris. Mm Mm-hmm. Taubes. And you had friends that said this guy did a pretty thoughtful job. Do you think that you could read it and judge it fairly? Harris. Well, if you're asking me, I would have a professional responsibility to read it at this point. Taubes. Right. Harris. If it really was thought to be breaking new ground... But many people, I think this is a fairly well-known phenomenon, that people tend to silo themselves and not want to read something they are happy to not agree with, that they have a vested interest in not agreeing with. Taubes. It's not only not want to read, it's not be able to read. I try to imagine reading such a book, and I can't actually imagine it. And again, you have a professional obligation to read it. My mother was a militant atheist. I was raised to be an atheist. I just, what I am and how I think, I can imagine after 20 or 25, every paragraph I'm going to be thinking, what about this? What about that? Why didn't you say this? Of course, that's not how you interpret it. I mean, you know all these knee-jerk responses, and I'm simply not going to be able to do it. The cognitive dissonance is going to be so profound That right or wrong, I'm not going to be able to get through that book. And then there's just this tendency to assume it's crap. I have been asked many times by many people if I believe in God. I don't like this question. I generally respond by stating that I act as if God exists, but that's not sufficiently true. Who could do that? Who could conduct themselves with the moral exactitude and care necessary of someone who would dare to make that claim, either claim, Jordan Peterson. It was the fall of 2018, and I was an intern at National Community Church in Washington, D.C. I was a kids director, which meant that I led Sunday school at one of the church's seven locations and planned lessons for the other locations during the week. Over many days of that internship, I found myself feeling incredibly miserable. I would drag myself out of bed at the last possible minute before being late because I dreaded going back to work at that church. I felt like a phony because at that point in my life, I found myself to be almost certainly an atheist. How did I get to that point? After being raised in a Christian home and being fairly insulated in a Christian culture during my formative years. Then, how did I end up working for a church? having to closet my serious doubts about the church's broader legitimacy. A couple years before the internship, I took a class at Lee University called People and Cultures of the Arab World. In that class, I first read a primary text for a religion other than my own. The professor specifically said at the beginning of the semester, I don't want any of you losing your faith in this class. I've studied Islam, I've lived in Islamic countries, but I stand by the tenets of the Christian faith. The goal of this class is to inform you about Islam, not con- not to convert you from Christianity in any way. Yet, by the midway point of the semester, 
after reading through much of the Quran and selected hadiths, I for one was in full-blown spiritual crisis. How could I know the truth and validity of my faith when this other worldview seemed to make so much sense? Growing up, almost everything I learned about Islam was reactionary to 9-11. Muslims were extremists who were clearly bent on destruction and ruin for as many as possible. They died as murdering martyrs, explicitly targeting the Christian United States, or the Great Satan, as they called it. It was not until I took this class that I realized the gross biases and errors in such an outlook. The terrorists perpetrating the bombing of the World Trade Center in 2001 were extremists, but did not represent Islam as a whole. In fact, the primary goal of the Prophet Muhammad in his day, according to the Quran, was to bring his people back to monotheism, the worship of the one God. This did not sound very different from what the prophets of my own faith tradition had sought to do, bring the people back to God. As translator M.A.S. Abdel Halim pointed out in the introduction of his translation to the Quran, The Quran clearly defines the relationship with earlier scriptures by saying, He has sent the scripture down to you, prophet, with the truth, confirming what went before. He sent down the Torah and the gospel earlier as a guide for people. 3, 3-4 three through four. Indeed, it urges the Christians and the Jews to practice their religions, 5, 58, 45, and 47. They are given the honorific title of people of the book, and the Quran appeals to what is common between them. Say, people of the book, let us arrive at a statement that is common to us all. We worship God alone, we ascribe no partner to him, and none of us take others besides God as lords. 3.64 Halim says that in the Quran, Proverbial statements can be lifted from the text and used on their own, isolated from their context and unguided by other references in the Quran that might provide further explanations. Both non-Muslims eager to criticize Islam and some Islamic extremists have historically used this technique to justify their views. I came to find that the same can be said for the sacred texts of other world religions as well. Books that have lasted through centuries of human inquiry can be ripped apart, fairly and unfairly, with vastly different interpretations. So, for the first time in my life, I was not blinding, blindly accepting the line that I had been given considering other faiths, namely that they were wrong, but instead began considering the possible validity of these worldviews. And this was difficult. It was as if I was rethinking the entire world around me, reality as I had known it even. I told a friend at the time, after some particularly difficult mental brooding, I wish I hadn't been raised in any religion. Then I could look at all of them fairly and decide for myself which one is correct. Of course, with a few years behind me, I can see that this idea was both idealistic and naive. I assumed that a non-religious upbringing would have allowed me to reach true objectivity and that such an upbringing would not come with its own set of biases and mental blocks. The cognitive dissonance mentioned by Gary Taubes in the opening quote. Regardless, I started looking for more big picture truth. I no longer rejected wholesale the worldviews that seemed opposed to my own. Many people, it seems, have similar experiences when they go to college when perhaps for the first time they are confronted with people and ideas from different backgrounds and have to adjust their understanding of the world accordingly. It can be an intensely painful process. I transferred to New Mexico State for my last year of undergraduate to chase a girl who would later become my wife. While there, I didn't take any religion courses, but did read a few books that impacted me deeply. One in particular I just happened to pick up at Barnes & Noble because of its interesting title, How God Works by Marshall Brain. I started reading this book and got my first taste of atheist apologetics, the dismantling of faith systems for the purpose of convincing people of God's non-existence. I thought the book was far too reaching in its conclusions, but I was also deeply troubled by thoughts that Brain 
made a lot of good points about the nonsensical nature of belief in a higher power. Like a well-trained evangelist, he concludes his book with an invitation to see the light, in this case to think rationally and reject the irrational belief in God. The concluding chapter of Brain's book is called A Brief Resource Guide for Recovering Believers and starts with the following passage. If you're a believer and you take the message of this book to heart, you'll have started down the path toward becoming a critical thinker. You can then apply your critical thinking skills to your religious beliefs. You will see your religious super irrationality collapse. It may seem like you are waking up from a bad dream. How in the world did I ever believe all of that absurdity? May be your reaction. You wake up in the real world, free of imaginary gods and all the superstitions that go with them. This invite was alluring and seemed to demand a response from me at that point. Either accept it and change the way I approach life, or write a book in response to it. I didn't think that simply rejecting the argument that Brain had presented and moving along was an option anymore. I preferred to write a response, but as graduation approached, I also didn't have the time to research for and write a book. So the argument for scientific atheism simply stayed on the back of my mind, gaining subtle momentum. As graduation did approach, a good friend of mine, who happened to be the campus minister at a local Church of Christ, gave a message about following your calling and not waiting on it. It spoke to me at a time when I didn't know what to do next, and reminded me of something that I had told my parents at age 7, that I wanted to be a pastor. Through the years, my parents and other relatives reminded me on occasion that I had said it. I didn't know what to believe next either, so to speak, but this seemed like a decent step in the right direction. I knew about a church in Washington, D.C. that advertised a year-long ministry training program. I applied and got accepted. I had proposed to my girlfriend recently, and her and I agreed that she would join me in D.C. after she finished her last semester of nursing school. So in August of 2018, I found myself across the country in the nation's capital. I was following a spiritual calling, but also felt like the spiritual foundation of my upbringing had crumbled, to be replaced by God only knew what. In a word, I didn't know how to know anymore, and wondered if it was ever going to be possible to know again. If I had worked in a different field, it probably wouldn't have caused so much mental anguish. But now I was working for a church, heard Christian messages all through the week, and even taught them to kids via Sunday school lessons, all the while seriously doubting Christianity's claims to truth. I had come to D.C. after feeling prompted, somewhat mysteriously, to do so. Yet I oscillated between believing that I had made the right choice and believing that I had just manufactured the prompting in my own head. To make matters worse, I was very lonely. DC can be a lonely place in itself, but being recently engaged and spending the first six months of the engagement long distance made matters worse. Video calls and a couple of visits from my fiance mostly just reminded me how much I didn't want to be stuck across the country from her. I would often fantasize about packing my car up, driving the 30 or so miles back to New Mexico, and getting a job in something very unrelated to ministry. All these factors led me to a type of internal desperation and despair. At one point I asked my internship director, trying to sound hypothetical. What if you had an atheist protege? They called us protégés during our year-long internship. He, of course, knew it wasn't hypothetical but his response surprised me. I'd say, cool, it's not our job to change people's hearts. One day after work, I was playing basketball alone at a local park. Combined with listening to music, a podcast, or an audiobook, this activity had served as therapy for me many times over the years, since I had started playing the sport in fifth grade. It had served well to clear my mind of what was going on in my daily life. Maybe just to torture myself, this time I had searched world religions on Spotify. One of the first results was an interview of social critic Camille Paglia by clinical psychologist Jordan Peterson. 
I hadn't heard of either of them, but gave the podcast a chance and was struck by several things over the course of the conversation. Most notably, Paglia called herself an atheist, but in the same breath proclaimed the importance of world religions. In her words, I'm an atheist, but I see the great world religions as enormous works of art, as the best way to understand the universe and man's place in it. I find them enormously moving. They are like enormous poems. The true revolution would have been to make the core curriculum of the world education the great religions of the world. I feel that that is the only way to achieve understanding. Pegley's argument was that the, with the majority of humans on earth still holding on to some form of, religi- of religion, and with their religious backgrounds varying on key points of understanding, we would be best off as a species to understand each other's spiritual and religious traditions. After this conversation had sparked my intrigue, I looked into other works of both Paglia and Peterson. I was drawn more and more to how Peterson in particular assessed religious belief and truth from the psychological perspective. He was not a pastor, clergyman, or even a practicing Christian, but gave validity to practicing faith by discussing its utility. He painted a picture which focused on the intellectual backing of belief in a higher being, even if he did not fully ascribe to that belief himself, as his opening quote above captures. A spark was lit, and I devoured Peterson's lectures and books. I came across a four-night debate between him and neuroscientist Sam Harris, and I was awoken, in a sense, from my mental and spiritual stupor. Harris's scientific knowledge and his resulting conclusions were dizzyingly intriguing. He seemed to me a more balanced and fleshed out version of Marshall Brain, still an atheist who claimed to draw people, who aimed to draw people out of religious belief, but less propagandistic and more intellectually honest. I had a new, worthier mental adversary. And Peterson's psychological knowledge and state of possibilities for the human psyche were equally curiosity stoking. Mostly, Harris and Peterson debated on the side of atheism and nuance higher belief, respectively. The conversations were bogged down often due to Harris's nearly constant need to define terms and Peterson's refusal to define simplistically the term God. And yet there were many moments of intense clarity when both men flashed their genius in support of their well-researched perspectives. Upon watching the debates... I not only found reason to continue in my internship, I now had fresh reasons to consider the claims held by theism, at least. I also was reinvigorated to take part in the grand conversation itself. The conversation about God's existence, or lack thereof. A conversation that seemed to stretch across all of the human experience, as far as I could now tell. After all, I wasn't the only one struggling to reconcile ancient religious traditions with the modern understanding of reality. I was reinvigorated to seek out the truth, wherever it was to be found. Inspired by Harris and Peterson's nuanced approaches, I could now do so without despair. The conversation quoted at the beginning of this chapter comes from an episode of Harris's Making Sense podcast. Interestingly enough, during a dialogue about what foods are healthiest for humans to eat, Gary Taubes, Harris's guest in the episode, is a scientific journalist specializing in nutrition. When Taubes asked Harris if he could read a book explaining that God exists, it was almost certainly rhetorical and not meant to be taken as a literal challenge to a listener. However, it was the exact kind of urging that I personally needed to kickstart this project. It is only fair to state here, in the opening introduction, I am not seeking to prove God's existence, I do not presume that I can, but rather to give a modern philosophical account of why the probability in favor of God's existence is solid. Following that, I will seek to explain why it is wise, as Peterson suggests, to live as if God does exist. In Peterson's quote at the beginning of this introduction, he succinctly provides explanation of his own nuanced theism. 
He details how it is far too simple, especially in today's world, to ask it as a yes or no, does God exist? Such a question necessitates detailed unpacking. In this modern world, our thinking is very much influenced by religious traditions of the past. For example, we somewhat instinctively look for deeper meaning amidst the mundanity of our days. More recently, and to an increasing degree, our thinking is influenced by the scientific method. I will also state here for the first time, but certainly not the last time in this book, that science's recent influence is very positive overall. The educated and clear thinker now hypothesizes, looks for evidence to verify or nullify the hypothesis, and adjusts future actions accordingly. We are, of course, yet imperfect at this process, but its application leads to greater consistency in rationality and logic. In a word, today's thinker is better equipped for good thinking. Science has upgraded our thinking processes, but it could be as philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche has suggested, that religious thinking had to come first for scientific thinking to come later. Nietzsche suggested that the Western mind required intense disciplining before it could eventually think scientifically. Interestingly enough, the Christian faith, via the Catholic Church, provided that discipline through strict ritualistic behavior and thought patterns. Such a step may not be historically verifiable one way or the other, but we do know that religion came before science, with alchemy serving as the intermediate link between them. I will argue that science and religion have too often ignored each other, to the detriment of each discipline, and to mankind as a whole. Much of this book will follow the often competing systems of thought between two camps. On one side is the nuanced theist camp, consisting of thinkers such as Jordan Peterson, lay theologian C.S. Lewis, ex-pastor Rob Bell, and the author-poet Christian Wyman. On the other side is the modern-day atheist camp, comprised of thinkers such as Sam Harris, biologist Richard Dawkins, cognitive psychologist Steven Pinker, primatologist Robert Spolsky, and the late great physicist Stephen Hawking. My intent in separating these into camps is not to create what Sapolsky would call an us-versus-them dichotomy of mutually incompatible factions, but rather to describe generally two reputable worldviews fairly on their own terms. And there are of course differences in each individual's belief, but the former camp's common ground lies in the belief that God's existence is likely, and or that religious traditions have practical merit. The latter camp's common ground lies in the understanding that scientific evidence points to there being no god or gods, and that religious practice may have been of some use historically, but certainly can be discarded now. There will be plenty of thinkers cited, like the physicist Albert Einstein, who don't fall cleanly into either camp, but who have added meaningfully to the conversation. I hope I can do all parties justice in my assessment, despite my own limitations, biases, and ultimate goal to persuade in one direction. An assessment and synthesis of this kind is somewhat necessary for belief today. As Malcolm X said regarding the changing world in a 1965 interview, everything is being modernized. Malcolm X was a truth seeker during his life. He revised his views on, and adherence to, the Nation of Islam after he went on the Hajj and found that some of the nation's practices were incompatible with the Islam that he found. I respect the man greatly for such intellectual humility, and grieve what was missed that he could have added to the conversation had his life not been tragically cut short. New information calls for reanalysis of older belief systems, and the two camps this book seeks to engage with have done that difficult but necessary work. This work is not complete, however, which is why books like this one, and countless debate platforms, podcasts, and documentaries, continue to necessarily exist in the grand conversation. Before diving into the body of this work, I feel it necessary to give a final what, why, and how of what readers can expect in the following pages. What?
I will be explaining that God exists to the extent that his existence is the most likely option, given the full-scale picture of humanity. It is therefore in one's best interest to live according to that likelihood. Admittedly, it is possible that God does not exist, and I will do my best to avoid obscuring the reasonings behind that possibility. It is a conviction of many of the world's smartest people over the last two centuries that this possibility is valid. While I will survey a handful of the thought processes behind these convictions, the main purpose of this work is to provide a philosophical weight for the belief that God does exist. I will be making my case with an initial call for humility. When we don't know, we shouldn't feign knowledge. As the intellectual giant Isaac Newton said, Hypotheses non fingo, or I feign no hypotheses. Paradoxically, humility itself deserves a grand definition, an explanation of its necess necessary utility in life. For we know very little of full reality. Humility is correct in its position that we should not prop ourselves up as if we do. With this in mind, it would be ironic and hypocritical if a book focusing on humility had an author who is dogmatic in his assumptions and conclusions. Therefore, I will attempt to make only one main assumption in this book, that truth exists. From here, I will be using the word truth with a capital letter when it is appropriate to do so. Using a capital T truth assumes that there is an objective truth to reality, or many truths describing that reality, which are not mutually incompatible. Therefore, I also assume to reject that the aspect of postmodern thought which says that truth is only subjective and defined by personal experience. The view that there is no consistency or meaning in the world, I will explore somewhat, but ultimately reject. Without these two assumptions, questions of reality such as, does God exist, are unapproachable. My hope is that we will find them to be worth approaching. In assuming there to be objective truth, I do not mean to communicate in any way that I have a full grasp on it, am some kind of authority on it, or that I am even fully capable of understanding it with my own mind. The assumption is only that truth does exist, hence the proper noun designation for the remainder of the work when referring to the type of truth which is objective or ultimate, applicable to all scenarios. Why? As, as stated, I come from a Christian background and still put myself in that camp. So why rock the Christian boat, so to speak, by writing this kind of book? I would respond to such a question by saying that we can no longer ignore the facts facing us in the modern world. A large portion of today's smartest thinkers and greatest contributors to the grand body of knowledge are atheists. What does this mean? It does not entail a death sentence for belief or faith as a whole but it does mean that we are flirting with cognitive dissonance overload if we do not inquire about why the atheist movement is increasing in the scientific community, especially today. The point to me is not that science is causing the death of God, as Nietzsche called it, but is instead causing us to reevaluate our first principles. The human species as a vast majority still sees the need to find meaning beyond itself. Science has revealed a substantial amount more of reality to us recently. Where is God in that newly revealed reality? For Christians and religious adherents more broadly, such a question has to be wrestled with. The Hebrew Bible describes God's people as Israel, or those who wrestle with God. The ancient man Jacob earned this title when he wrestled with a mysterious being who seemed to be God himself as described in Genesis 32 and recounted in the opening quotation for this book. Our modern times provide plenty of opportunity to wrestle. If we can avoid the ever-present distractions that seem to define our time in history. I am also writing this book as an explanation to myself. I still struggle with belief, and challenging myself with different viewpoints continues to drain even if I find that action necessary to sustaining life. This book will provide reasons to believe, ones I hope to take to heart myself.
While I was interning in D.C., Pastor Heather Zempel once told us interns, Pastors preach most the things they need to hear. The same holds true here. I write an argument that I myself need to consider. How? In accepting Taub's hypothetical challenge to provide an explanation that God exists, I will use the following format often. If X, then most likely Y. The great conversation previously alluded to has been underway for millennia, even if only recently, in the last 200 years or so, reaching its current level of fever pitch. So I use the if X then most likely Y format for the sake of balanced conversation, hoping to avoid communicating that I have the final word on anything. After all, we humans can truly know precious little. Instead, we wonder, we ask, we inquire, we doubt, we rage, we deny, and we affirm. In a word, we wrestle. Lastly, a final word about my personal qualifications. I've intimated that the question may have arisen by now from several readers. Who are you to be writing this book? All the people you've mentioned so far have titles in front of their names. They are experts in their fields and have contributed in some sizable way to human knowledge. Who are you to be taking on such an audacious challenge as God's existence itself? Granted, I am not an expert in any field. Rather, I'm curious and like to argue with myself and occasionally others. At the risk of sounding undisciplined, I've never specialized in one particular field because I wonder about too many topics. This is probably why I ended up with a BA in Individualized Studies degree. Regardless, I'll be painting broad strokes in this book. My hope is that it inspires curiosity, even if the extent of that inspiration is limited by my abilities as a writer. I am not so deluded as to think my argument will provide any final answers to the big questions ahead. Audacious? Perhaps. But then, we are all audacious for asking the kinds of questions that we do as humans. Modernity calls out for us to seek answers. Or, at the least, to find questions that are decently worded. Mm -hmm.